Good morning to everyone. Many thanks for attending this event. The Kansas State Department of Mathematics is hosting a women lecture series in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Association for Women in Mathematics. The women lecture series includes distinguished lecturers and colloquium talks by women mathematicians planned throughout 2021. Today, we have the fourth of such talks. It's a colloquium talk by Betsy Stobal from the University of Wisconsin at Madison who will be speaking about maximizers and near maximizers for Fourier restriction inequalities. Betsy Stobal earned her PhD in mathematics from the University of California at Berkeley in 2009. She continued to an NSF postdoctoral fellowship at UCLA and is currently an associate professor and the LNS Mary Herman Ruenstein professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison where she has been since 2012. Her research focuses on the interactions between curvature and two of the fundamental operators of harmonic analysis, convolution and the Fourier transform. A recurrent theme of her work has been to prove new inequalities by precisely quantifying their near counterexamples. There will be a Q&A at the end of the talk. You are welcome to submit questions through the live chat in YouTube by signing in with a Gmail account. My colleagues, Lisa Inatsieva and Tanya Firsova will monitor the questions in the chat and will read them to Betsy once the presentation is over. Thanks again for attending this event. Betsy, when you're ready, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the invitation to speak here. And thank you for organizing this event. The AWM and, and women's organizations have meant a lot to me. Um, over during the course of my career and provided a great deal of, of support. So I think this is great. Um, not only that the AEWM has been around for 50 years, but also that there are these events to celebrate. Um, so I want to start with a little bit of background um, for my talk. And so with the, a lot of this talk is going to be about operators and their norms. And so let's recall a little bit from first year graduate analysis. So I have two Bonnach spaces, X and Y. And so these are vector spaces with a norm uh, that makes them complete. And I have a linear operator T mapping X into. What we learn in first year graduate analysis is that The operator T is continuous if and only if T is a bounded operator. In other words, um, if there exists a constant C such that we have that the norm of TF in y is less than or equal to c times the norm of f in x for every f in x. Or equivalently, that t maps the unit ball or the unit sphere in the space x to a bounded set in the space y. So often in harmonic analysis, we just want to prove that there's some finite c that exists and maybe only for some f in some dense class, and then we can use continuity to extend the operator from the dense class to the whole space. But today we're going to look at um, questions involving a bit more precision. And so we need to discuss the operator norm. So if T is a bounded linear operator, it's norm. One way of viewing this norm is as the smallest constant C, so that this inequality one is valid. But another way of viewing it is as the supremum on F in X of the norm of TF in Y divided by the norm of F in X. Now, of course, here I need the denominator to be non-zero so I can specify that F is non-zero or by scaling, I can specify that the norm of F and X is equal to one. So we're going to have a particular setting in this talk and I want to introduce that briefly. So 
So I'm going to have my Bonox space is going to primarily be LP, usually LP of RD. And this is the set of all measurable functions F. And RD into C, where they have the norm, which is given by the integral of F to the peak power. And it's raised to the one over P so that it scales. This definition makes sense when P is finite. When P is equal to infinity, of course, this doesn't make sense. Um, sorry, and let me erase the stray mark here. Of course, this definition doesn't make sense. And instead, we think about Yale infinity norm of F as being kind of like the supremum, but adapted to the measured theoretic context. And sometimes in the type of um, analysis that I'll discuss, we might replace this manifold RD, um, sorry, with a man with this. Rd with some manifold sigma. And we might replace the dx, which is Lebesgue measure, with a measure d sigma of x on the manifold. Um, so an important operator in harmonic analysis is the Fourier transform. Um, and we can start out defining it this way as an integral, so f hat of c is equal to the integral on rd of e to the minus i x dotted with c f of x dx. This definition makes sense if f is in L1. And the idea here is that um, I want to think about correlating f with this planar wave e to the i x dotted with c. And if I have high correlation, that gives me a big value of the Fourier transform. And then I can apply the Fourier inversion formula for nice enough functions f, and this f hat of c is going to become the amplitude of the planar wave e to the i x dotted with c. Now, this definition only makes sense when this integral converges, namely if the function f is in L1, but there's a wonderful theorem called Plancherel which tells us that the Fourier transform extends from L1 intersected with L2 um, to an isometry on L2. Um, and likewise, there's the hausdorff young inequality which tells me further that I can extend the Fourier transform to every LP space between one and two. And I get the following inequality, the Fourier transform in LP prime of RD is bounded by some constant times the norm of F in LP of RD. This is valid when one is less than or equal to P is less than or equal to two and one over P prime is equal to one minus one over P. So now I want to go back to my general bounded linear operator. And I have an inequality if t from x into y is bounded, then I have that the norm of tf in y is less than or equal to the operator norm of t times the norm of f in x. And so we can ask a lot of questions about the reverse inequality here. Now, of course, we remember from our basic logic class that if I reverse this inequality, I'm going to have less than or equal to and greater than or equal to. That means I must have equality. And that leads us to the first question. Let's call it questions about greater than or equals. So the first one is, do there exist? functions f such that the operator norm of tf is equal to the norm of t times the norm of f. Okay, 
So of course, there's always one function, namely zero. So let's specify that this is non-zero. This question, the answer to this is elementary. Um, if X is finite dimensional, and, and the answer is yes. Um, if X is infinite dimensional, however, the unit sphere is not compact. And so this um, may fail. There may not exist solutions to this equation and it's a non-trivial problem. The next question we can ask is to identify properties such that I have a partially reversed inequality. So instead of this inequality, I have um, that the left-hand side is greater than or equal to some constant C times the right-hand side. And this is interesting in two different regimes. So as C increases to one, the question becomes harder to answer. And so such functions F should have more properties. As C decreases to one, the question becomes easier to answer. So these functions F should have fewer properties, but it would still be nice to have some quantification of those kinds of properties of the functions F and identify some structures. Now one can also, if one knows enough about them, in, so, um, I call these functions extremizers or maximizers. This regime, these are the near extremizers or near maximizers. And these are the quasi extremizers or quasi maximizers. So if we, if we understand enough about the near maximizers, then perhaps we can actually find the operator norm. And maybe if the answer to the first question is yes, we can find out who the extremizers are. So now I just want to discuss some examples and some applications of maximizer problems. And let's start with a non-example. Let's see an example where maximizers don't exist. So I want to give a very simple operator. So T maps L1 of R into the complex numbers. And I take my function F and I integrate it against the function one plus x squared, one over one plus x squared dx. So what happens here, this is a function who's, who, that has a strict maximum of one, it's zero. And so the operator norm of t is equal to one, but extremizers don't exist and extremizing sequences have to concentrate. So now our example, the most famous example is due to Beckner, who proved around 1970 that Gaussians uniquely extremize the Hausdorff-Young inequality that I wrote down on the previous page. And he used this, a natural corollary, if this isn't a precise computation of the operator norm of the Fourier transform. Later, Lyon developed a very powerful technique called concentration compactness. And there's a, a related thing that comes with this, which is called a profile decomposition. I'll give an example of this phenomenon a little bit later in the talk, but the idea is that if we have a sequence of functions that are saturating the norm, then we can decompose these into some orderly profiles that are compact in some sense, and we can understand these profiles really well. Moreover, they don't interact very much with one another, and they also don't interact that much with one another after we apply the operator. So we have these orderly profiles, and then we also have some disorderly remainder. And the disorderly remainder is sort of random, and our operator is kind of smoothing, and it makes that remainder very, very small after we apply the operator. This is an extremely powerful technique. It's had great success in the study of partial differential equations. Um, and there have been many adaptations by others. Um, so now 
Um, one reason why we might want to use, um, to study maximizer problems, well, there are two. So one is sort of theoretical. So the first is we want to sort of understand what structures are driving up the, the operator norm. In a speculative direction where I'd really like to take this is I'd like to be able to look at a family of operators whose norm is unbounded and I'd like to understand what it is that's forcing those operator norms up by understanding the functions that are making these big. Now, more practically speaking, If we understand extremizers and near extremizers, sometimes they let us improve certain inequalities that we want to study. I won't go into this in much detail, but this is a written in a few places. So one is in the study of dispersive PDE. So they know, for instance, that some very small solutions scatter over a long time. So they're well approximated by a solution to some linear equation and they want to transfer this to more general functions. And they, they achieve this by studying some threshold where we go between scattering and um, not scattering. Another example is an improved bounds for certain Fourier restriction operators and improved bounds for averages on curves um, and multilinear inequalities. And I'm happy to talk about these sort of details after the talk. Um, now, today, we're going to focus on the current state of the art of these questions for certain operators that are very close to my heart, and these are the Fourier restriction and extension operators, which I'll define them. Okay. So today's setting. Um, are the Fourier extension operators. Um, and so I want to give you a specific example, but there are many of a similar flavor. So the extension operator associated to the paraboloid in one plus D dimensions. Okay, so I'm going to start, well, let me write it down and then I'll tell you what everything is. So this is defined to be for a nice function F, this is the integral on RD of E to the I T X dotted with norm xc squared xc dxc. Okay, so f is a function on rd. That's why I can write this integral this way. This is the dot product of tx between this point that lives on the paraboloid, so norm c squared c, whereas this, this is an rd plus one. And so that's where this tx is. So T, I think of as being a real parameter, and X is an RD. So the big question um, about these um, operators is for which P and Q is the extension operator extend as a bounded linear operator from LP of RD to LQ of RD plus one in the conjecture. Um, which is rough, it was introduced by Eli Stein around 1970, really in, in the 60s, um, is that um, we have an LP LQ inequality, so the norm of EPF and LQ of R1 plus D is bounded by some constant times the norm of F in LP of RD, um, if and only if RQ is some exponent determined by P, um, so this is D plus two over D, P prime, and this is larger than two D plus one over D, and this condition ensures that Q is larger than P. Um, and so the conjecture, this is um, elementary to prove. When Q is equal to infinity, 
and P is equal to one. Um, it's resolved by work of Pfefferman, Stein, and Zygmunt when D is equal to one. And it's open in every other dimension despite a whole lot of work by um, a, a, a large number of people. Um, And so the goal, we start with, we, it's elementary for Q equal to P and P equal to one, and the goal is to lower Q and raise P. And so um, in the interest of time, I'm going to tell you about the records for this, but I won't write down the names. I'm just going to say the names of the responsible authors. Um, so when D is equal to two, the conjecture is that um, this theorem holds for, well, you can do the quick, you can do the computation and you can see that um, this critical exponent Q is equal to three when D is equal to two. Um, it's known for Q larger than 3.25. And this result is due um, to uh, Larry Guth and Basan Sharia. There's also an important work of Hong Wang, um, which gives an improved estimate in a slightly different configuration. In larger dimensions, it's a little bit complicated depending on which dimension you're in. The result is either due to Guth or to Hickman and Rogers, and then that's combined with work of um, Tao, Vargas, and Vega. And so there are some alternative ways that one can ask this question. One doesn't really need just the paraboloid here. One could replace the paraboloid by the sphere of dimension D and RD plus one, or one could replace it by a different kind of manifold, such as a curve. Um, or another manifold or even a fractal. And so why study this problem? So one reason is the adjoint of this is very interesting. So the adjoint is morally speaking, it's the composition of I take a function, I take its Fourier transform, and then I try to restrict that function, that Fourier transform to this manifold, the paraboloid. Um, and so this, the study of this operator tells us the measure theoretic properties of the Fourier transform. Um, it's also connected to questions of the decay of solutions to dispersive PDE, um, at questions in analytic number theory about decay estimates for certain exponential sums, um, questions in geometric measure theory about the volumes of um, certain sets, um, and also, it turns out to be closely related to um, convergence of questions about convergence of Fourier series um, and the forms of the Fourier inversion formula. So now we're going to discuss not new progress on toward this conjecture, but instead the related question of the reverse inequalities for this conjecture. And so I'll look first at a, the class of results that can, that gives the identity of extremizers. Um, and as I'll state as a model result. So, um, and this is due to, um, again, I'm going to say the names and not write them because there's several authors involved. So this is due to Hosky, Wundertmark, Zarnitsky, uh, Bennett, Bez, Carberry, and Wundertmark. Um, in, Via different techniques. And so the theorem is that if P is equal to two and Q um, is equal to Q2, which is um, D plus two over D P prime. In other words, two D plus two over D is an even integer. So, um, And this requires that either D is equal to one or D is equal to two. Then extremizers these exist on um, ender centered Gaussians. Uh, 
and there are various approaches to this. And there's a key identity Um, so we want to compute the norm of the extension of f in on q. So this is always equal to um, the norm of the extension of f to the q over two in L2 raised to the two over q. The reason I like L2 norms is because they give me access to Planck-Charles theorem. So this is equal to the norm of the extension of f to the q over two Fourier transform. And so now if q over two happens to be an integer, I can rewrite this as a convolution. So I put dot, 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 but in reality, I only have two EF hats or I have three EF hats um, in L2 to the two over q. Um, and so then one studies this, this multiple convolution. Now the conjecture is that this result holds as well in higher dimensions. Oops. So when P is equal to two and Q is equal to Q2, um, the extremizers are always centered Gaussians. Um, and so there are other special cases that have also been studied, and these include the sphere. Um, so here, so a good question, a good guess, if you want to study an extremizer problem relating to the Fourier transform or Gaussians. Now, if we instead look at replace the manifold, the paraboloid with the sphere, a good guess is that the extremizers might be constants. And there are certain configurations of P and Q for which this is known. And there's important work of Foski, Oliveira, Silva, Carniero, Tila, and others um, on this question. So for, um, So related, so for P goes to SD, extremizers are sometimes constants. Um, and when um, we instead replace P by uh, the two-sheeted hyperboloid in two dimensions, then there's also a result that extremizers do not exist. And this is due to Kilodron. Um, so now we turn to questions about the existence of extremizers. And so we'll discuss and I'll describe a little bit of the proof of the following theorem. Um, so let's assume that the extension operator maps L P naught into L Q naught. So I want you to remember, this is a big open question. What, for which P's and Q's exactly does this inequality hold? And so we're going to start out by assuming quite a lot that it's been proved in some range. If one is less than P is less than P naught and Q is this Q P, Then, first of all, extremizers exist. And two is um, if F is really close to achieving the operator norm, 
F has to be really close to being an extra miser. And the way we express that is in the following way. So if the norm of, if I have some sequence and the norm of that sequence, the limits in that sequence are normalized to one and desaturate the operator norm, then after applying a symmetry, and also a subsequence, which I'm gonna sweep under the rug, um, such that S N F N converges to some function F and this convergence is NLP. And of course, then F has to be an extra miser by continuity. And so here I'll write down um, a bit about the citations. Um, so when P is equal to two, the big step to proving this theorem is proving that there's a, what's called a profile decomposition. So this um, the thing that I mentioned earlier, um, this idea of Lyon, um, and so the profile decompositions were developed by Chiarani, uh, Merle Vega, uh, Bego Vargas, Um, and then it was observed by Shao that these profile decompositions could be used to show that there were extra misers. Um, when P is not equal to T, uh, the result is due to me. Um, and I'll try to explain what's different between P equal to two and P not equal to two. Um, so there are several related results. Um, there's a theorem of Kristen Kilodron. Uh, which states that um, when P is not equal to two, the centered Gaussians are not extremal. Okay, so knowing who the extremizers aren't is not quite as satisfying as knowing who they are, but at least we know something. Um, and there are also results on other manifolds. So um, when uh, P is replaced by the sphere um, and P is equal to two, there are results of Franck, Lieb, Sardin, that have a sort of a similar flavor to this, but it's not quite as um, as stark of a result, um, except in low dimensions. Um, and also, Fanelli di Siglia Vega. Um, which shows that extremizers do exist. Um, this one is on the scaling line where Q equals D plus two over DP prime. And this is strictly off of the scaling line. And the analysis is really different in these two cases. Um, but this is only when P is equal to two. More recently, there's a result of my former student, Jean-Man Biswas and myself, um, which gives a similar result for all values of P for a curve. So we replace the P with the model curve um, T, T squared through T to the D. Okay, so now in this result, um, I introduced this notion of symmetries. And so let's look a little bit at what these symmetries are doing in this problem. So the rough idea is that the, the paraboloid is a geometric object that has a lot of symmetry to it. So I can dilate it. There are certain linear transformations that preserve it. And these lead to a lot of symmetries of this related operator. And so let's write, to, and these complicate the analysis, but they also help with the analysis. So here they are, we have the dilations. 
And so I start with a function f um, on rd, and I can replace it with the function f of c over lambda, lambda to the minus d over p. And this is an LP isometry. Now, if I apply the extension to this dilated version of f, I'm going to get a dilated version of the extension of f. And that is um, the extension of f in lambda squared t, lambda x. Then this is an LQ isometry. Um, we can also have frequency translations. And so here I start with my function f of c, and I subtract off a small frequency parameter c naught. When I apply the extension, I get a modulated version. It's modulated and tilted. And finally, I have one class of, of symmetries that don't really have anything to do with the paraboloid, and these are the modulations. Okay. So I take my function f and I modulate it. And when I apply the extension, I just get a translated version of the extension of f. I also have the compositions of these three. Whoops. Now, there are some symmetries that aren't on this list, and these include the rotations by the orthogonal group and also multiplication by um, unimodular constants, but these aren't don't really play a role in our analysis. So the other surfaces mentioned, so namely the sphere and the this curve, um, they're analogous symmetries. Okay. So now I want to give you an idea of how this theorem was proved um, by these other authors when p was equal to two. And the key step is um, the profile decomposition. Um, and a good play, a good reference for this are notes of uh, Rowan Killip and Monica Vichon. Um, so the theorem is that if Fn is a bounded sequence in L2, then after a subsequence, which again, I'm going to sweep under the rug, I, I have this decomposition. So Fn is equal to a sum of some symmetries, and these are allowed to depend on n and this index j times some fixed profile that's independent of n. So this is reflecting a kind of compactness of this part of, the, of, of this piece of F. And then I have some remainder term. So this is NL2. This is a symmetry. Um, and this is for all j less than infinity. Okay, so the properties here are, first of all, I have a nice L2 orthogonality. So I can understand the norm of F by understanding the norm of these simpler parts. Second, I have really good LQ orthogonality so the pieces don't interact much with one another after I apply the operator.
And finally, the remainders are small in the following sense. And so I want to describe to you, um, so the basic idea behind proving this is we start with a sequence. So if this is equal to zero, then we're done. We can just make all of Fn our remainder term. And so we suppose that this is not equal to zero. And um, again, after a subsequence, we have a symmetry. I'm just going to take its adjoint such that when I apply it to Fn, it has a weak limit, phi 1, which is non-zero. Okay. So now, um, the Hilbert space structure of L2 means that when I subtract a weak limit, the norm gets smaller. And this is really, really, really important. And that's what gives us this inequality one. Certain properties of the operator and PDE estimates can be used um, to give two. Um, and finally, if we iterate these two steps, it's going to continually decrease what we're left with. So the Fn's that we're working with are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and eventually we're just left with the remainder. So this is an iteration of these two steps implies three. Okay. Um, and for the extension from curves, this argument generalizes. Now, this argument breaks down when p is not equal to 2. So in particular, when p is not equal to 2, we don't have the Hilbert space structure. And so we don't, we can't apply this argument and get this nice decomposition here. And that leads to big trouble. Um, and so I want to um, sketch for you why um, the, how we get x to minus is when p is equal to 2. Okay, and so we're going to start with a sequence at n with LP norm equal to one and extension. Oops, L2 norm equal to one and extension converging to the operator norm. Okay. Then the extension is equal to the limit of the extensions of the Fn's. But I apply my profile decomposition in LQ orthogonality. This is actually equal. This is less than or equal to, so I have an operator applied to a function. I can bring out the operator norm. This is less than or equal to um, the Because q is larger than 2, this is smaller than the sum of the L2 norm squared. But this is less than or equal to the extension times the norm of f on n. in L2, but of course that was equal to one. And so I'm left with the extension. Now the 
right and the left hand sides are equal to one another and so that means that all of these inequalities have to be equalities so if this first one um, is an equality that means that all of these phi j's are extremal if the second one is an equality that tells us that there's only one phi j because we have a sharp form of the little lp Helder's inequality. And if the third one is extremal, that means there's no remainder term. Rn has to go to zero in L2. Um, and so all together, this implies that um, our symmetries applied to Fn converge to some function F. And so again, the problem, this argument is very simple. This argument would immediately generalize to other values of P if we had the profile decomposition, but unfortunately we don't. So I'll just give you a brief outline of the argument when P is not equal to two. Um, so if Fn um, and the norm of the extension of the Fn goes to the done norm of E. Um, so the first step is a kind of a frequency localization. And so the idea here is um, I want to show that um, there's a symmetry and a subsequence, which again, I'll sweep under the rug, such that after applying the symmetry, um, F is mostly captured in a small region. Whoops, sorry. Where, and where F is not too big, okay, so F is really well behaved um, in this region, and this is capturing most of F. Um, now, this is this is sort of the hard step in a way. I want to break off little pieces of F that are making a big contribution and show that I really only have all those pieces that I'm breaking off look pretty similar to one another. After that, once I have this frequency localization, then I have so this function that's bounded and on a bounded set. This is in any LP space I want it to. In particular, it's in L2. And so I can apply the, um, uh, we can apply an L2 profile decomposition to um, S in F. So I'm gonna call this localized version of F, F in R. So we can apply the L2 profile decomposition to F in R um, to get a good spatial localization. And this allows us to get rid of the modulations. And then the third step is to um, remove the cutoff involving R. and uh, to get LP conversions. So now 
Um, there are a lot of open questions about these, and I just want to mention a few of them. So the first one that I'd really like to know, but I don't know how to approach this in general, is who are the extremizers? Um, a, an easier question might be to ask what further properties they might have. So for instance, are they analytic? Do they decay at a certain rate? Or do they observe some symmetries, et cetera? I'm also very interested in understanding this question um, in the cases of other manifolds. And in particular, there's ongoing work in this direction relating um, to, to the, the sphere and, and certain curves. Um, and the third question is um, that one can ask is, what's the rate of convergence to the extremizer? So if my operator norm is a certain is a, is a certain distance from the best possible, then what can I say about the structure of F? Is it also a certain distance from the set where you have the best possible operator norm? And these are all open, and I, I think that there are a lot of things that one can ask in this area. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Betsy, uh, for this wonderful talk. Um, Lisa, um, Tanya, um, let's wait for the questions uh, in the chat. In the meantime, uh, I'll ask one. So in the theorem, uh, you have assumed that EP uh, is bounded uh, from LP0 to some LQ0. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. So it's known in certain cases, and so the result is unconditional in right. those cases. And then, um, and then the extremizers uh, are found for p and q uh, with p strictly less than p zero, correct? And the corresponding value of q. What prevents uh, going to p equals to p zero? Yeah, actually, so this is a really good question. So let me um, let me go back to the statement of that theorem to say that this is. Uh, So the first, the first thing I want to say is, if the restriction conjecture is true, is true, then um, this inequality, then this um, bound actually holds for p zero in an open ray. So it it it, it holds for p zero on the ray that goes between one and then it's a strict inequality at two d plus one over d. Um, and so if the conjecture is valid, you actually don't have this sort of endpoint at which we don't know whether or not there are extra mm -hmm. Um, But the method sort of takes advantage of the fact that um, our exponent is between two. So our exponent p is between two and some other exponent where we have validity of this um, conjecture. Excellent. Um, and, and, and so it's sort of an artifact of the proof. And then you mentioned that uh, there are uh, some, uh, some work going uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, changing the setting, uh, the mm -hmm. paraboloid to some other manifolds. Are these type of techniques something that uh, can be translated to those settings or they require a complete set of uh, different techniques? Yes, so in part they can be translated, but let me tell you a little bit about this work of Franck Liebsaubin in particular. So, um, and and you can see the kinds of issues that arise. So let's look at the let's look in particular at the case of the sphere. Okay, and so what goes wrong with the sphere? So we have the, we have, well, let's recall what our symmetries are. So we have the dilations. We have the frequency translations. 
And we have also um, the modulations. Well, these were our symmetries in the case of the paraboloid. Now, in the case of the sphere, the dilations are broken. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so there's a sort of a partial symmetry, but it, it's not really a symmetry. We can think about functions that are concentrating around one point. That's sort of like a dilation, but it's not a true symmetry of the, um, of the surface. We had the frequency translations before, so we don't have these, but there's something similar. So this is a rotation. Um, and the modulations, will those stay the same? And so um, what happens in this analysis is that whereas for the paraboloid, we can rescale um, a, a, a concentrating sequence and, and recover another sequence in the space, for the sphere, a concentrating sequence, we can't rescale to another sequence on the sphere. Instead, what happens is as you get closer and as you zoom in on a point of the sphere, it starts to look like a paraboloid. And so another operator pops out. Another interesting feature of the sphere is that we have antipodal points. And so these antipodal points mean that, um, you know, a little neighborhood here of the sphere looks an awful lot like a little neighborhood here. And um, so this complicates the analysis a little bit and these kind of these points can interact very strongly with one another. Whereas in the case of the paraboloid, separated points don't really interact. And so this is, you can see this in the work of Franck-Leaf Sabin. And I think it, that looking in the case where P is not equal to two, one's also going to see similar phenomena in Bryce. Thank you very much, Betsy. Thank you. It looks like there are no questions in YouTube chat. Yeah, well, there are multiple thank you. So I can just add this also. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was thank nice, you. but it's it's hot. I, I think that there is a problem with Lisa's uh, connection. Um, question. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, I want to thank Betsy very much for uh, her wonderful talk. Uh, and again, I want to thank the audience for um, attending this event. Uh, I'd also like to remind everyone that the next uh, talk of this Women Lecture Series will be on April 22nd by Irene Fonseca. Um, and thank you again for attending this event. Thank you once more, Betsy. Thank you.